So we begin. Well, good morning and welcome. This weekend is Ride and Stride, when people either walk or cycle, or I think run, although I don't think we've seen any runners, between churches in Oxfordshire to raise money for the Oxfordshire Historic Churches Trust and also for local churches. And we've got a team from St Hughes who've been out on riding rather than striding. So Ben, whereabouts have you come from? Um, from Bambury. And have you just set off from home? Yeah. So this is your first stop? Yes. And where are you going to next? Bodicott Church. Bodicott Church. And I think you've done this before. How many times have you done it? I think I've done it four times. That's absolutely brilliant. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and why do you do it? Yeah. Because it's fun. Because it's fun. Great. Well, I hope you enjoy the rest of the ride. And thank you for doing it. Well, good morning and welcome everyone. Welcome also to those of you who are joining us online and a special welcome this morning to Ben and Genevieve and Hazel who clearly completed the cycle ride yesterday because they're here with us this morning. How far did you get? Do you know how many churches you did? Another two or three after this one. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, we are in the season of autumn, so the conkers are just beginning to turn brown. I don't know how many of you noticed of that. I'm, I'm guessing, Ben, you might have noticed that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we're also in the season of creation. It's the time of the year as a church where we particularly focus on and give thanks for God's gifts of creation. Uh, and so we begin our service this morning by singing the hymn, uh, praise to the Lord, the Almighty. I think it includes the King of Creation. Yes. So we join in singing that together.
So grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And so we pray together. Almighty God, you bring to light things hidden in darkness and know the shadows of our hearts. Cleanse and renew us by your Spirit that we may walk in the light and glorify your name through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. In this season of creation, we're reminded of the wonder and the beauty and the gifts of God's world, but also of our capacity to pollute, to harm, and to destroy. We're reminded of the ways in which our greed and our selfishness are destroying our planet. And so we come to a time of confession. And as we do so, we confess to the Lord of all creation. And so we pray together. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought and word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. So may the Father of all mercy cleanse us from our sins, restore us in his image to the praise and the glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we join together in the collect, the special prayer for today. Lord God, defend your church from all false teaching and give to your people knowledge of your truth that we may enjoy eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we remain seated for our first reading. First reading is taken from James chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise 
and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our gospel reading is read to us by Clive, and it will be up on the screen. The reading from Mark, chapter 8, beginning at verse 27. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist and others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get me behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life. Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. There was talk earlier this week of the possibility of a cabinet reshuffle, possibly a ploy to ensure MPs would vote in favour of the Social Care Bill. And as the Prime Minister looks for loyalty for those who will back him, I was wondering, daydreaming, in the light of the reading that Clive has just read from Mark, if the Prime Minister might look round the cabinet table and ask his team, what are people saying about me? How do you think I'm doing? And having heard some of the responses, then make it so much more personal. No longer they, the electorate, but you, you who are a member of the cabinet, the inner circle. What do you think? What 
do you say? Well, my daydream didn't come up with the answers. But we're halfway through Mark's Gospel. We're in chapter 8. We're in the midpoint. And we've come to a turning point in Mark's account. They're at Caesarea Philippi on the slopes of Mount Hermon. They're away from Galilee. And they're away from the crowds. Jesus is alone with his disciples. And it's a key time for them and for him. And so he asks of them, who do people say that I am? What do people say about me? What do they think? And the answers come back, probably as predicted, as people compared Jesus to, or at least saw him in light of people who were key in their faith. Whether the more recently John the Baptist come back to life, well, that must have amused the disciples because they would have heard that John had actually baptised Jesus as an adult. Others said he was Elijah or one of the other prophets. And so Jesus turns the spotlight around. He faces the disciples themselves with the question, but what about you? What about you? Who do you say that I am? He knows that they would be in the best position to answer. After all, they've spent time with him when he was on the road, when he was teaching the crowds, when he was engaging the religious authorities, when he was healing the sick. And they'd also spent the quieter moments with him, away from the crowds, away from the public eye. They'd seen him at prayer. Times when they see the other, the non-public side to him. And they would have had time to build up their own opinions, to have their own impressions of the sort of person that Jesus was. After all, they had all responded to his invitation to follow. And the question, of course, comes back to us, as if Jesus is saying to us, I don't want other people's ideas. I don't need you to recite a creed or even to say what you think I want to hear. Who do you say that I am? And our understanding of who Jesus is and why he came is all part of our journey of faith. And we're probably, I'm sure, at different stages of that journey. But that was also true for those first disciples. They didn't grasp everything all at once, if at all. For them, it was a season of discovery of beginning to see themselves and the world they were part of in a new light. It was opening up the possibilities that the God who had seemed so distant could be present, could be involved in their lives in a way they never thought possible before. And we join the disciples, where having come so far with Jesus, there is now an opening, if you like, of the eyes, an awakening to where the journey from now on is leading. As Peter declares, you are the Messiah. There's no applause, there's no moment of celebration Instead, Jesus tells them to keep that knowledge to themselves because their understanding of what 
you are the Messiah means. They don't yet have. And so the journey is now changing direction. And as that journey changes direction, Jesus begins to teach them what that means. Begins to teach them that the Messiah must undergo great suffering be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and after three days rise again. And for Peter, that is just too much. He rebukes Jesus for saying such things, wants him to stop talking like that, to change the tone, to change the content, to change the direction that the journey seems to be turning in. For the disciples were longing for a king, the true king of Israel, who will rule with justice and mercy, and one who would win against their enemies. But Jesus seems to be talking about losing, about giving in, about death. And Jesus returns the rebuke, for Peter's words speak of human concerns. Those words do not foresee the divine picture of what God is going to bring about through Jesus. Jesus, who's been announcing the kingdom of God, is now acknowledging to the disciples and to them alone at this point. Not only is the kingdom of God coming and present, but he is the king. And that the way ahead is going to be tough. It's going to be risky. And that following him as the king is the only way to go. The direction of travel has changed. For the disciples and for us to begin to understand and to grasp the depths to which God was willing to go to is also a journey. It's a journey of belief and some doubts. It's a journey of questioning but also of reassurance and it's often a journey of self-discovery. For us too, it may mean that we have to rethink some of the thoughts that we have long held on to, allow them to be challenged, and maybe to change direction. But it's a journey that we need not take alone. For the one who walked with and taught and challenged and led the disciples is the one who through his spirit accompanies us now. Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And we make our response to that question as we affirm our faith in God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so we say together, we believe in God the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And so as we come to our prayers, we have our, our pebble pool, and I just wonder whether Ben or Genevieve or both 
might like to bring that pool forward for us. Would that be okay? Great, thank you. Pebble pool is here through the week, and people place stones in it as, uh, as a sign of their prayers. And then always on a Sunday, we, we offer those prayers to God. And it's being brought very carefully. Brilliant. Thank you both. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we hold these, uh, these pebbles before you as signs uh, and remembrances of people's prayers. And we pray that in your mercy, you would hear our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. And now Colleen is going to lead us in our prayers. When I say, Lord, hear us, please respond with, Lord, graciously hear us. Gracious God, we thank you for the church throughout the world and for its huge diversity. As the letter of James refers to the destruction that can be caused by the tongue, we pray that in all our churches we would use words to breathe life and hope and comfort and acceptance, as well as praise you, Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. With news continuing to come from Afghanistan, we pray for the people who live in fear and with great uncertainty. We continue to pray for the people of Myanmar and for the situation in Lebanon. We pray for the people of Haiti who have lost their homes, for those affected by the floods in Nepal and the storms in America. A joint message this week from the Archbishop of Canterbury, Pope Francis, and the Ecumenical Patriarch, Bartholomew, declares that climate change is an immediate and urgent matter of survival. May we be willing to make meaningful sacrifices for the sake of the earth which God has given us. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We give thanks for our local community for the different organisations offering support and assistance. We thank you for the Dementia Active Group, which meets here on a Monday and a Thursday. And we give thanks and praise for all who work as carers in the community. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously hear us. <clears throat> With the pandemic continuing throughout the world, we pray for healthcare systems to have the resources which they need for vaccines to be offered to the most vulnerable, and we pray for our National Health Service and all those known to us who are in unwell in mind or body. We pray particularly for Peter, Janet, John, Anna, for your healing in their lives. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Gracious Lord, whose spirit brings comfort to those who mourn, we pray particularly today for the family of Sue Birchall and others known to us who are bereaved or coming up to the anniversary of a bereavement. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Colleen. <clears throat> Jesus came and preached peace to those who were far off and to those who were near. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Shall we wave that peace to one another? And just to the camera at the back, to everyone at home, greeting you as well.
So in obedience to our Lord's command, we take this bread and this cup. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened wide his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your spirit that this bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. So with your whole church throughout the world, we offer you the sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven as we say, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. In times of hope, in times of trouble, in times of sorrow, in times of praise, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. In our one body, because we all share in one bread. So draw near with faith and receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Strengthen us in faith, build us up in hope, and make us grow in love. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Anita, do we have some notices? Uh, thank you. Just a huge thank you to everyone who helped with the Ride and Stride yesterday. We had about 10 people helping on the welcome uh, throughout the day, and we had... Um, Certainly fewer than usual people coming through, but it was lovely to have you with us. And we had Hazel and Matthew and Benjamin and Elliot and Genevieve and Gabriel from St. Hugh's taking part. So, yay! <laughs> and they, as you know, raised money for the historic uh, Churches Trust in Oxfordshire and also um, half of the money comes back to St. Hugh's. So if you still owe sponsorship to them, please, um, if you have it today, please give to Hazel. Thank you. Um, on Friday morning, I've had kind of like a person invite to a Zoom coffee morning, uh, which the Leprosy Mission are running, um, with Pam Rhodes speaking. And rather than just keep it to myself, I thought I'd come into church, we can use the screen and put it up on the screen. So if anybody would like to come for a cuppa, about 10.45 on Friday morning, uh, then please, you're very welcome, please join us. And the other thing to say is that today, for the first time in many, many months, we're going to have coffee after the service. Thank you. So, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And so we have our, our final hymn, still keeping in that theme of creation. Jesus is Lord, creation's voice proclaims it.